Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where each week, Pastor Jeff Cranston explores biblical theology that provides practical life applications in an understandable way. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker, and along with my dad, Pastor Jeff Cranston, we have been working our way through the Bible Overview series. We're more than halfway done, so if you've missed any episodes there, go back and catch up. We're going to be in the New Testament today. And Dad, I ran across this fictional story that I think illustrates really well what we're going to be talking about on today's podcast. So normally you get to share the stories. Today I'm going to share one, so bear with me. The story today is about two brothers who were convicted of stealing sheep. So as part of their punishment for stealing the sheep, they were branded on their forehead with two letters, S-T, to indicate sheep thief. One of the brothers just could not deal with the embarrassment of it. So he decided to move away somewhere no one knew him or knew what it meant, and he never came back. The other brother, though, decided he was going to take a different approach to this. He said, I can't run away from what I have done. So instead, I'm going to stay here. Everyone knows what the ST on my forehead stands for, but I'm going to stay and try to win back the respect of all of my neighbors. I've stolen from them, but I'm going to try to repair the relationships. So years passed. The man slowly but surely began to rebuild his reputation, and now he really had a reputation for integrity. Years down the road, he became an old man. There's a newcomer who came to town, was curious about this man who's walking around with letters on his forehead, S-T. So he asked someone else in town, what do the letters S-T stand for? The other guy paused for a minute and says, it happened so long ago, I have forgotten all the details, but I think the letters are an abbreviation for saint. (laughs) That's a great, great story. Good story and very well told. And it, it does remind us how, how people can change, doesn't it? And hmm, we, we know so. that the gospel changes everyone that it comes into contact with and it saves. And, and that's what we see today in Paul's letter to another man whose name was Philemon. We sort of gone from last podcast, the book of Job 42 chapters to the shortest letter that Paul wrote. And yet somehow the podcast is going to be the same amount of time. I don't know how <laughs> how that happens. <laughs> I love it. All right. So the story got us started there, introduced us to Paul's letter to Philemon, reminding us how people can change, introducing that. So dad, let's start with a brief overview of, as you said, this very short letter. What is it about? What's the letter to Philemon? Okay, well, Philemon was a Christ follower. He lived in the city of Colossae. We know the letter of Colossians. that We've already done an episode Mm -hmm. on that book, that letter. And he was a convert of Paul's, led to faith in Christ by Paul himself. And we know Philemon was a very well-to-do individual. We know a church met in his house in Colossae. We know that he and Paul were intimate friends. The other character in in this letter is Onesimus. That was the name of a slave who belonged to Philemon. Now, he may have been a very bright young man, very talented young man, because the Roman army, after a victorious battle, often took the brightest and best young men and women and brought them back home and would sell them into slavery. And that very likely could have happened with Onesimus. Well, it appears, as you read through the letter, that Onesimus stole some money from his master, Philemon, and he ran away to Rome. And while there, Onesimus managed to find Paul. We don't know exactly how. So you have to wonder, was Onesimus in prison with Paul, having been arrested for stealing? We, we don't know. Or maybe he had run out of money at that point and knew that Paul would help him. And so he tracked him down in prison. We, we just don't know. But since Paul started the church in Colossae, which he did, by the way, and knowing the fact that Philemon was leader in the church, it's highly probable that Onesimus already knew Paul, that he just didn't, in a city of 150,000 people, that's how big Rome was at that time, he didn't just happen to run into Paul. He he searched (laughs) him out and found him. Let's pause there for just a second. You said that this is a letter written by Paul. 
What do we know about his authorship of this letter? Give us some more details there. Yeah, well, on Paul's third missionary journey, there were three. This is uh, on his third one. For more than two years, Paul ministered to the people of Ephesus, and we have the letter to the Ephesians. That was a very successful period for the apostle to the Gentiles, and Paul and his ministry partners, they saw many converts to Christ among the people who lived in Ephesus and visitors to the city of Ephesus. And one of the visitors converted under Paul's teaching was a man named Philemon. And we know, as I just said, he was a slave owner, among many other things, from the city of nearby city, by the way, of Colossae. And so, Tiff, if you'll read verse 19, that'll give us a little bit of an understanding here. Sure. And before I do, I should maybe mention that because of how short this letter is, it's one of the rare occurrences where a New Testament book has no chapters. So you asked me to read verse 19. It's not in a specific chapter. (laughs) There's only 25 verses in the whole book. So here's verse 19. Paul writes, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back and I will say nothing about what you owe me for your own life. That gave me a thought just then. Kitchen table theologian, what other New Testament books do not contain a chapter? That's your little quiz here during this episode. What other New Testament books do not contain chapters? I guess I should say chapters. Like there's only one chapter, but it's not even really a chapter. There are three other books in the New Testament besides Philemon. What do you know what they are? So if you hang in there, Tiff will let you know at the end of today's podcast what they are. And if you get all three, we'll just say congratulations. We have nothing to, to, to give you. <laughs> well, but let's get back to it. Paul was saying that there, that whatever Philemon and what you just read there, whatever Philemon had lost financially, Paul was willing to repay him. But while Paul said that, he also rather adroitly, cleverly, I think, reminded Philemon, hey, you owe your salvation to hearing the gospel through me. So Paul just kind of throws that out there. As you read the letter, Paul addressed Philemon as his beloved brother, as a fellow worker. And Paul only called fellow workers people who had served alongside of him for some time period of time. Mark and Luke, who both wrote Gospels, also were called this by Paul. Actually, in the book of Philemon, he calls them fellow workers. So clearly, a kinship, a friendship existed between Paul and Philemon, one that would serve a very significant purpose in light of the circumstances that brought about the letter. So Paul not only claims authorship, he says that he wrote it in his own hand. He didn't use a secretary or a scribe as he did so often. So that may explain his brevity. Many scholars believe Paul had terrible eyesight, couldn't see well, so therefore he didn't do a lot of writing. But this is so personal and such a personal appeal in this letter here that Paul, and I think it gives some gravitas to it. Paul said, hey, man, I'm I'm writing this in my own own hand to you. So yeah, he calls the author, no doubt about it. That is interesting that he says specifically, I wrote this myself. Like, this is just a note between me and you. I wrote it. All the longer letters he had help writing, but this one he personally wrote. Okay, when did Paul write this? Give us a little bit of background of where we are in the life of Paul and his ministry. Well, we know he was imprisoned for two years in Rome, and we also know that he wrote what we call prison epistles during that time. He wrote four of them. Philemon is one of those. The others are Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians, which means he wrote this around 60 to 61 AD. We know from some other biblical sources that Paul had already been planning to send a letter to the Colossian church, and he was going to deliver it by a guy named Tychicus. We've met him before. So in AD 60 or 61, from a prison cell in Rome, Paul wrote a personal letter to Philemon, and then how did he deliver it? How did he get back to Philemon? Here's the interesting part. He sent it back with Onesimus, the runaway slave. Hmm. So Onesimus goes back to Colossae, goes back to Philemon. And I'm sure when he walked through the door, Philemon's probably like, what are you doing here? I can just imagine Onesimus going, before you say anything else, you need to read this. And (laughs) I, I don't know, but that 
something along those lines must have happened. Right. Well, Kitchen Table Theologian, it's a very short book, as we've said. So we encourage you to take three or four minutes today. That's all it would take. And read what really is this beautiful letter of Paul's to his friend Philemon. And as you just mentioned, he wrote to intercede with Philemon to forgive his runaway slave and to receive him back now as a brother in Christ. He spent some time with Paul. Now Paul's writing this letter. And as you said, he's showing up. Okay, here you go. Read this from Paul. <laughs> so if, as you read it, if you take a few minutes today, you'll see that Paul is courteous. He is tactful. He's delicate in what he's writing and generous at the same time. He even appealed to Philemon to receive Onesimus in verse 17. The quote says, as you will receive me, which I think is just, you see that personal touch there. So Dan, let's take just a second and hit on some of our theological themes. I don't know if you have one or more today, but we know some people question whether we should even say that this letter has a theology or a theme in it, a theological theme, since it's just a short practical letter written to one individual person rather than to a church, rather than to a group of people in the city. So, but we know that any book of the Bible clearly has something to teach us today in terms of theology and doctrine. So fill us in there. Yeah, absolutely. It does have a some rich theology to it. Paul's message to Philemon was a simple one. Based on the work of love and forgiveness that has been wrought in your own heart, Philemon, by God, show the same to the escaped and now believing slave Onesimus. It also appears that maybe, possibly, Onesimus was also led to Christ by Paul. So Mm -hmm. as he goes back, he goes back to Philemon as a brother in Christ. Paul had explained the gospel to Philemon, and there had been a profound change in his life, a result. As it does to every new Christian, there's new life blossoming in a once dead heart. So based on that, Paul makes a request and he wants Philemon to forgive Onesimus and accept his slave back, not so much as his slave, but now as a brother in Christ. And not only that, Paul takes his appeal a little bit further. He wants Philemon to consider sending Onesimus back to Paul. And in verses 11 to 14, Paul says, I have found Onesimus useful in God's service. So we've got to remember that the letter to Philemon was not preserved in the New Testament merely for historical interest, let's say, but in order to teach us the practical difference that the gospel does make in reconciling God's people. When there's been a fissure or a break or a division, the power of the gospel can bring people back together. I think that if I were to boil it down into a succinct statement, it would be that the theological focus of Philemon is how the gospel brings reconciliation between those who were formerly estranged. The power of the gospel can bring reconciliation to people who had once been estranged. And I think that plays itself out in showing one another love, forgiveness, Even acceptance, Philemon accepting Onesimus back into his home, doesn't it? Is that right? Yeah, I think those three things, love, forgiveness, and acceptance, you see that throughout this letter. Onesimus comes to faith in Christ through Paul, and in so doing, just like it is for anyone who comes into God's own family through Jesus, Onesimus found a new family, a new web of loving relationships. And it is precisely Philemon's love toward Paul that forms the basis of Paul's appeal to Philemon. And and Paul emphasized Philemon's love in the opening of, of the letter. And he said this, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love. And then he says, for I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So as someone who had come to believe in Christ, Philemon had a genuine love, Paul says, for all of the saints, all of the Christians, all of us, we all have room to grow. And in this letter, Paul writes, he appeals to Philemon, hey, use this opportunity to grow in your love by accepting back his estranged slave, Onesimus. And Paul would have known this is a difficult request. This has got a lot of layers to its onion, right? So (laughs) Paul makes the appeal very carefully. (laughs) 
And he doesn't say anything explicitly until verse 17. And, and Paul says, so if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me, what you had said earlier. So that's a big ask. Mm-hmm. And just as if I were coming to you, Philemon, I, I want you to accept Onesimus the same way. So you, you see there a personal example of how love and reconciliation can bring closure, I think, to a, a rift in a, in a relationship. Now, I'm curious. We are not told how the story ends. We don't have a return letter from Philemon back to Paul. So is there any history background here? What do scholars believe happened? What do people think happened? How did this situation turn out? I would love to know. Yeah, that's a great question. And I wish I had a great answer for you. Oh. <laughs> and I, my, my answer is, I, I guess we'll find out in heaven one day because we're not told biblically. There's a lot of things I want to find out in heaven. One of the things I just preached on last Sunday was the woman brought to Jesus who was brought to him who had committed adultery, has been caught in the act of adultery. And they're asking, what should we do with her? Moses says, stoner. Jesus stoops down and writes with his finger on the ground. We all want to know what he was writing. We don't right. know. We all want to know what happened with Philemon and Onesimus and Paul, but we don't know. But there are perhaps, there are maybe a couple of clues. In verse 21, Paul says, confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. So what is the more hmm. that Philemon might do? Some suggest that, that Paul expected Philemon to free Onesimus. Others suggest maybe that Paul wanted Philemon to send Onesimus back to work with him, as he says he desires him to do. Would Philemon have to free Onesimus to send him back to Paul, or could he keep him as a slave and say, okay, you can go work for Paul for a while? We don't know. Uh, Others, finally, others think Paul had nothing specific in mind, but that he simply expected Philemon to exercise the full extent of Christian love, whatever that might entail and however that would play out in that certain situation. It's just too difficult to know. We do know, however, that the gospel offered hope not only to the free, but even to the enslaved in the first century. We read a number of Paul's writings about people who are in slavery bondage, but they're members of the church. The gospel had changed Onesimus's life and given him hope for the future as a slave. And can you imagine the courage It must have taken for Onesimus to go back to Philemon. Mm -hmm. Maybe Philemon was there when Paul was writing a letter and he's reading it and and he's like, Paul, that's an incredible letter. That's great. I love that. How are you going to get it back? And he's like, oh, well, you're going to take it. You're You're like, you're kidding. (laughs) He had a new name, a new family in Christ. He had this, and that that eclipsed all of the, the other stuff. The gospel had changed Philemon's life and enabled him to love the one who had wronged him. So this letter then is not merely a practical letter and a friendship letter, but a a letter rooted in the theological and life-changing truths of the gospel, that it brings reconciliation between those who were formerly estranged. And the gospel has the power to change everyone. Back to that story at the beginning. Let's answer the question, kitchen table theologian, did you know the other New Testament books Without any chapters, I had to look them up. I did not know that there were four of them. So we have this one, Philemon. The answer to the other three. Here we go. Second John, Third John, and Jude. All three of those books, well, I guess four in total, do not have chapters. So and there we go. If you got Learned those, well today. done. We applaud you. I give you, I give you applause. <laughs> Way to go. Oops. All right. Well, thanks so much for listening to Kitchen Table Theology Podcast today with Pastor Jeff Cranston. If you're enjoying the podcast, would you consider leaving a rating or a review, especially on iTunes? We do deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. Don't forget, you can check out today's episode notes and more at jeffcranston.com. Also, feel free to email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. As always, thanks are due to our friends at Low Country Community Church here in Bluffton, South Carolina, and at Streamline Podcast for making this podcast possible. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be continuing our Bible overview series with a look at the Psalms. Until then, always remember the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. Thanks for joining us at the table. <laughs>
You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, please check out our show notes. If you have a question from today's podcast, kindly email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.